I find these little bits of history a little bit interesting personally. Um, back uh, over the centuries, it has frequently been the case, yeah, that'd be wonderful, thank you. It has frequently been the case that believers are abused and believers are taken advantage of and, and indignities and all kinds of injustices are done to them. And uh, very frequently, people who stood for the cause of Christ would be uh, in danger of being committed to insane asylums in some times in human history, and it could be coming back. At any rate, um, the story is told that, and apparently it's a true story, that um, in an insane asylum in Europe, uh, and a man had died. He had perished after being incarcerated for years. And as they were cleaning up his stuff out of the um, room, they found right at the side of the bed some interesting graffiti on the wall. What he had done is he had taken a poem that was probably in the area of 800 years old in a different language and had translated it into English. And whether or not he was mad, we don't know, but what he scratched on the wall is, could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made? Where every stock on earth a quill and every man, a scribe by trade. He translated that. So whether or not he was, um, as the um, individuals that had incarcerated him declared he was um, insane or not, I would say is very much open to question. We will probably meet him. Those are the circumstances where the words for that hymn came from. Um, interesting to know the background sometimes. Turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 18, please. Luke chapter 18, verse 31. Then he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem and all things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles and he will be mocked and mistreated and spit upon. And after they have scourged him, they will kill him. And the third day he will rise again. But the disciples understood none of these things and the meaning of the statement was hidden from them, and they did not comprehend the things that were said. Heavenly Father, I would pray that by your mercy, by your grace, we would not be numbered with these men. Grant us, Lord, the ability to understand these things. Grant us, Lord, the meaning of this statement, that it would not be hidden from us, Grant, Lord, that we would comprehend, connect the dots. And I pray that that would happen to your glory and our joy. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, last week we started this passage. We observed that this event is recorded for us in all three of the synoptic gospels and three gospel accounts. And of course, that points to and um, or underscores an importance of the passage. If it's written once anywhere in the Word of God, it's important. But this is a this is a very important event. As we saw, this was of course not the first time Jesus had predicted this very thing. As we saw last week, uh, he had said something very similar to this about five months earlier, and he had been making frequent reference to that 
uh, ever since coming up to this day. Now they're on the last climb. This is about two weeks before the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord. They are down at the lowest part of the earth, actually, on the globe, and they are about to climb up out of that into Jerusalem and do that for the very last time. They are the last climb to Jerusalem, and there he will be crucified and resurrected about two weeks away. There are a number of very important lessons derived from this statement. Last week we studied how it was necessary, compulsory, inescapable that scriptures be fulfilled. I would underscore that again. It's necessary. Scripture must be fulfilled. It needs to be fulfilled in a way that even the most severe critic must concede that the details are fully, literally fleshed out in a way that is verifiable and readily confirmed as it is written, even to a hostile audience. Scripture must be fulfilled. And I would say again, never bet against Scripture. Never be pushed to adopt a discounted version of what is clearly written. Well, it goes on and we, we, as we continue, the next phrase is, he gets into some details. He says, for he will be handed over to the Gentiles. And again, all of this he predicates, in fact it says here, uh, verse 32, 4, it meaning that there's a continuation of the thought here. Um, and the, the original thought is, Scripture must be fulfilled for he will be handed over to the Gentiles. Now, this is the first mention of this detail, and it is a detail that was not, to my knowledge, spelled out with this kind of clarity at all in the Old Testament. He had predicted in chapter 9 that he was going to be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes. And as a matter of fact, we saw, and we'll see again, in Isaiah chapter 53, written 700 years earlier, that's precisely what we would expect. But here, really, we have an ancient mystery resolved. An ancient mystery resolved. When the scriptures described the capital punishment of the cutting off from the land of the living, for example, in Daniel chapter 9, it just says that he was going to die. And we knew from other passages he had to die in Jerusalem, but it, it said he was going to die. He was going to be, not just he was going to expire, but it was going to be, he, he died as a result of a... a a death sentence being commuted upon him or that being carried out upon him. He was going to die. But always when it talks about his death, the death of the Messiah, it describes a set of circumstances of his death that were not in accord with death by stoning. The means by which Jewish people were commanded by God to put people to death was through the idea of public stoning. That is how the capital punishment was supposed to be done. But it describes the Messiah dying in under circumstances that do not accord well with a stoning. Turn if you would. Let's look at a few of them. And, and I'm doing this because it's a wonderful apologetic opportunity. Isaiah chapter 52 for a moment. Isaiah 52, verse 13. Who's he talking about? Well, it makes it very clear right off the bat. Behold, my servant. And here, this is in a whole section. Those of you who have come through the, uh, the Isaiah series, we, we see that signal phrase, my servant. This is in a section of the my servant uh, oracles of Isaiah. And it very clearly, as he's going through... He's talking about someone who is human, but at the same time talking about someone who is, by their nature, Yahweh as well. Okay? And it was 
the anointed one. Or if you would put that anointed into Hebrew, you would say he was the Mashiach. Or if you want to say that in, a, in the Greek language, you would say he was the Christos, anointed one. Okay? So, behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. And we go, oh, isn't that wonderful? Messiah is going to be well received. Just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Um, do you know what that's saying? That's saying that something was going to transpire, be done to him in such a way that he would be disfigured to the point that it was hard to find out or hard to affirm he was human. He was going to be suffering physical trauma to the point that it was hard to figure out if, if, if he's actually human, a man left. It is talking about a horrendous uh, marring of his face, marring of his, of his uh, physical attributes. His form more than the sons of men. In other words, it is, it is such that it, it's, uh, he's hard to identify. Thus, because of this, he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what had not been told them, they will see. And what they had not heard, they will understand. Let's go back for a bit to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. In any of the cases of stoning, there was never any doubt when it was all done. The, the, the victim expired relatively quickly. There wasn't this kind of a prolonged torture done to the body. So it was a mystery. How could, how could this all be handled? How could this be the case? Um, Psalm 22, let's start in verse 11. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. So in other words, he is encompassed about at the time of his death. Well, that was kind of understandable. That would be kind of on par with what a stoning was. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouths at me as a ravening and roaring lion. And then it says, I am poured out like water. And it's talking about the idea that there is a, an expiry that does not look like uh, something that would happen rather relatively quickly due to a stoning. It's talking about somebody who is over a long period of time, their life is literally wrenched out of their body. So it's, it's, a, it's a torturous death that's being described. All my bones are out of joint. Um, again, it, it's talking, and again, now we know, looking back what's going on. The, the cross, the means of death that was, uh, wasn't uh, uh, invented by the Romans, but it was certainly perfected by them, was a means by which you would be suspended by your outward extremities and you were leaning forward and falling down and being held by extremely sensitive places on your body. And, and what was happening is the crush of all of that was causing you to slowly suffocate. And the only way that you could get a breath was to pull on those very, very sore places on the wrist and push up on the exceedingly sensitive sore areas of the metatarsal area of the foot. Push up on this and pull up on this and get a breath. But slowly, slowly, you lacked the inclination because of the pain and the, the really the stamina because of the prolonged torture to keep on breathing. That's what's being discussed here. I'm poured out like water. 
all my bones are out of joint. One of the tendencies is to, is to cause dislocation because of the pressure that's put on, on the skeleton. My heart is like wax. It's melted within me. One of, there's, there's tremendous trauma being put on the cardio system. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. In other words, uh, strength is being dried up. There's a reference to the idea that there's a continual thirst. My tongue cleaves to my jaws, and you lay me in the dust of the death. For dogs have surrounded me, a band of evildoers have encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Again, not, not a Jewish thing. This is something altogether different, and yet it's talking about this is going to happen to the Messiah. I count all my bones, and we, we know the significance of this because we're taught this by the gospel writers. It meant that just like the Passover lamb, it was necessary that the Passover lamb not ever have a bone broken. Why? because it was to precede and it was to be predicting exactly what happened to Christ, where he was put to death, but not a bone was broken. And we know, of course, from the gospel accounts that there came a time where they're going, okay, well, this has sure been fun torturing these people, but we can't ha have their bodies hang hung over uh, the Passover period of time. We can't do that. They had the religious scruples of that, so they the Roman soldier said, well, what we'll do is we'll break that big bone, the, the, the bottom um, main bone in, in the leg, and then you won't be able to push up anymore, and then you'll die. And, and so they did that with the other two um, people who were being crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Christ, they found he was already dead, and they didn't break the bones. And the gospel writers point to this particular passage as, you see? You should have seen that coming. Not a bone was broken. They pierced my hands and my feet. I count all my bones. They look, they stare at me, and look at this. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Again, not a stoning thing. Um, this is talking about a, a mode of death that was altogether different than anything that they were familiar with. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 69. Psalm 69. Again, if we were thinking, well, I don't know if this refers to Christ or not, it, it, you know, it's an interesting um, coincidence. The gospel writers say, no, this is, this is predictive. It was intended to be predictive. Psalm 69, verse 20, reproach has broken my heart and I am so sick. And I looked for sympathy, but there was none. That is one of the circumstances. When, when in a moment here we talk about the idea where he was um, multiple, multiple uh, forms of sorrow were applied against him. This is one of them, in that all the while he was suffering, not even his friends were with him. Everybody had forsaken. For my comforters, but I found none. They also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Um, what an incredible thing that, again, this is now written a thousand years before the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, but a small detail like that actually being known and being anticipated um, with respect to the death of Christ. Zechariah chapter 12, we looked at the last time, I'll just mention it, they, it talks about the nation of Israel, at some point in time future to us, they look upon the Messiah and they say, they look upon the one whom they have pierced. And again, piercing is not something that was uh, something that was familiar to the Jewish thing. So, these were Gentile means of capital punishment, unheard of as performed by the leaders of Judaism. So, what Jesus is saying here, he's going to be handed over to the Gentiles. And very evidently then, Jesus knows precisely how it is 
that all of these prophecies that don't seem to connect with any of the dots of what they were expecting are going to be fulfilled. It needed to be that they were, he would be condemned by his own people, delivered over, given a death sentence, but that the death sentence was going to be done by Gentile hands. So Jewish authorities who did not have the authority to enact capital punishment pressured the Gentiles to kill Jesus in a Gentile way. Okay? And very evidently, Jesus knew this. He talked about it to Nicodemus early in his ministry in John chapter 3, verse 14. He talked about it in John chapter 10. Uh, the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. All of these things were, were things that it's showing that Jesus was very, very aware of what was going to happen to him. Why is that important? We'll get to that in a bit. Going back to our passage in Luke chapter 18. It says, He will be handed over to the Gentiles, and he will be mocked and mistreated and spit upon. Again, um, over and over again, it talks about uh, the being a man of sorrows. And it's not something that's so obvious in the English translation. It is emphasized in the Hebrew, and it's emphasized actually in many of the New Testament passages. But in the Hebrew here, man of sorrows, uh, that concept is multiple sorrows. Multiple sorrows. When it, when it talks about that in Isaiah, it's talking about not just a period of sorrow, but there are multitude sorrows. And, and uh, the New Testament writers always refer to a plurality of the sorrows. And one, that's one of the things that maybe we haven't often given a lot of thought to. There are multiple ways in which our Lord was sorrowed. One of them, uh, one of the things that I would find uh, the most distressing, um, I remember on one occasion I was being prepped for surgery for uh, cancer, and I was wheeled into a, the um, operating theater. Theater, I thought, operating theater. Mm. And I was wheeled in uh, in a condition that would be very similar to the day I was born. And uh, as I was laying there feeling rather exposed with about 20 people milling around, all of a sudden I looked up there and curtains began to open. And there's about 40 or 50 people all looking down. Oh, operating theater. These are for where all of the uh, surgical uh, students are. And I'm going, oh, no. And, and, and so I said to the doctor, I said, how long is this going to go on? And he said, well, not long. We'll be at it in, 15, in about, you know, 10 minutes or so. And I said, doctor, would you have mercy? Just put me out now. I, I just don't want to be here. Uh, it, the, the indignity of it. That's what our Lord had. For hours on end, a man who was a very dignified man, a man who at the same time was connected to the very Son of God who was august, respected by all of creation, uh, not, a, not a moment or uh, a particle of low life in him at all, to be exposed to that kind of um, embarrassment. He had people mocking him and goading him and you know, if, if you have a guy who's standing in front of you who's 300 pounds and he's a, a Shaolin monk and he's, you know, really good at fighting and he's beginning to mock you, I, I, I think I can, you know, uh, trim your sails, you, can, you have a, a, a better time of taking that and going, yeah, no, he probably could. You know, we can kind of adapt yourself to that. But if, if it's somebody that you know you could easily defeat, but for other reasons you are holding back. There is a tremendous frustration by having been goaded by people who are lesser, who, 
who don't really have the power or the authority that they think they have, having the power and the authority to do something about it and do it immediately, but withholding. That's what our Lord did. He said, I can call, and the idea is, thousands of angels at a moment's notice if I wanted to do that. And, and one angel in the Old Testament cleared 185,000 people overnight. Uh, you don't need a whole bunch of angels in order to get something done. But uh, he said, I could, call, I could call a massive army, way, way bigger army than, than the Romans could muster. And he's being mocked and goaded. There were multiple sorrows that our Lord was being subjected to. And here he, he lists the one, and hear it, these were the ones that were on his heart. These were the ones that are on his heart, being the one knowing what he was going into. Um, they, he is going to be mocked. He is going to be mistreated. And the idea there is I, he's going to be exposed to multiple miscarriages of justice. Multiple times where he goes, okay, so that's against your rule. That's against your own law. That's not fair. Multiple times. And spit upon. One of the greatest indignities that you could um, foist upon somebody during this time is to spit on them. And there's an element where that kind of remains the same. It is, it is a way that you can express ultimate um, disregard and, and disrespect, to spit on them. Our Lord knew that was what he was facing months before it happened. And yet, as we saw in the book of Mark, he resolutely, adamantly set his face and he started marching toward Jerusalem. The other people going around going, whoa, this is amazing. Does he know, does he know what he's going into? And the whole point is, yes, he knows what he's going into. He's going to be mocked and spit upon. And they will kill him. And this isn't the... the, the um, normal word for the word kill. It's, a, it's a, um, an intensified version of the word kill. You know, normally we, we say, uh, he, you know, what's the worst you can do? Well, you can kill him. And that after that, well, what is there left that you can do? But we do have a, a, a sense in our language where we say, well, that was overkill. That was, that was overkill. And that's kind of the, the spirit of this word. It's the idea of, uh, the, the word is apoktenosin, apoktenosin, which doesn't help you, but it, you understand that he's chosen a specific word. The, the world is full of words, he picked this one, and it, it, it means, after a fashion, kill him and keep killing him until he's dead, okay? So this is not just another attempt on his life. This is going to be a determined, deliberate and successful effort where he was going to be put to death. As Daniel chapter 9 says, he's going to be cut off from the land of the living. So he's telling his disciples, it isn't that they're going to try another uh, attempt on my life, like has happened many, many times. They're going to be killing me. It's going to be a determined thing, and they're going to be successful. They're, they're going to... I am going to be put to death, he's saying. And then, and the third day, he will rise again. And he's going, all of that is part of the first sentence that started out with, um, all the things which are written through the prophets have to happen. Where in the world did that come from, where he says, on the third day, I will write, where did that come from, written in the prophets? Turn, if you would, to... Matthew chapter uh, 16. Matthew chapter 16 for a minute. <clears throat> right 
Verse 1, the Pharisees and Sadducees came up and testing Jesus, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. Here he is, he had just fed basically four cruise ships full of people with a little brown paper bag full of food. And, and so they look at that and, and as a way to kind of detract from the spectacularness of that, of that wonderful miracle and to kind of going, yeah, I know, never mind, but, and, and, and kind of ignore that, they say, but can you show us a sign from heaven? They, they've seen this incredible outburst and they say, yeah, but we want to see, we want to see something, you know, interstellar. We want to, we want, show us something big this time which is a way of, you know, kind of downplaying what they had just seen. But he replied to them, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times? You are so spiritually dense, is what he's saying. And then get this, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. By the way, that's a good thing to be reminding ourselves because there are certain groups that are absolutely dedicated to we've got to have the next sign, we have to have the next thing, you know, uh, from the Lord. It is an adulterous and evil generation that's always seeking for us. I, I need something more. I, I got to have, give me more proof, okay? That's, that's an evil generation. It says, and a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. What? Except the sign of Jonah. Jonah. And he left them and went away. You say, well, why didn't he explain himself? Well, because he already explained quite well. This uh, Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Verse 38, then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. And he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign. So you can see this is something that keeps on coming up. This is a matter of weeks before. And yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. This time, the early time, he actually explains what he's meaning by that. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He's saying, do you know something? That whole thing about Jonah was intended by God right from the very beginning to be not just descriptive of what was happening to Jonah, but descriptive and predictive of what was going to happen to Christ what was going to happen to him so he says he's going to rise again on the third day and go on so what is the significance how how is this so important that we keep on seeing it in the Word of God well scripture demonstrates for us how both Peter and Paul use this truth the idea that Jesus was fully appraised of what was going to happen to him, and he could predict down to the smallest detail of what was going to happen to him, how there, there is an apologetic value to that, in, and particularly should be toward Jewish people, to establish that Jesus was the Christ. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 3. And we'll see how... In this case, Peter uses this particular truth that the Word of God predicted all of these things and Christ predicted all of these things well in advance of what happened. So Math, or Acts chapter 3, verse 12, But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, men of Israel, Why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety we had made him walk? This is the uh, place where he heals the lame beggar. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, Jesus, 
And what a thing to say to a group of people. He's got courage as Peter. The one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. In other words, there, there was a way that this could have been brokered that Jesus went away free, but it was at your insistence that he didn't. Okay? But you owned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murder to be granted to you. You're minded. This is what you this is what you as a nation, and this is what most of you who are listening individually did. But put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are all witnesses. And again, he could say that to the whole group and they all go, what? We haven't heard of that. There was by common consent they'd been put to death and by common consent, nobody was debating it, nobody was saying what in the world, God raised him from the dead. They, they all knew that. They all knew that. And on the basis of faith in the name of Jesus, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know, and the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance just as your rulers did also. There were some points where you weren't getting it. But the things which God announced beforehand, watch this, he's using this as a a means to prove who Jesus was. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. He's making an interesting point there. He's saying, if, if Christ had not have suffered, it would have brought, been brought very much into question if he was indeed the Messiah. And we see Peter making this kind of a, a, a central plank in his ministry. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll pick it up in the middle of a sentence, which is bad form, but we'll do it anyway. Verse 8, And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, in other words, that the, the prophet said, there's going to be an incredible gift that you are offered, okay? Uh, that would come to you, made careful search and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. So, again, it, rather than backing away from the idea of Jesus being persecuted and dying and suffering, in fact, it was used as one of the signal proofs of the fact that this indeed was the Christ. Paul used it similarly. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Specifically, as he's working with Jewish people, I'll start in chapter 17, verse 1, I guess. And when they had traveled through Amphopolis and Apolline, 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 in the, that place. They came to Thessalonica. There was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbath reasoned with them from the scriptures. So this is the common practice, this is what he always did. Explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I'm proclaiming to you is the Christ. He says it again in chapter 26, or he said it many, many times, obviously, from that passage, but we have written record of it in Acts chapter 26. Here he's talking to uh, his defense before Festus, verse 22, So having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both 
to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses says was going to take place. What is that? That the Christ was to suffer. And that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Again, he is emphasizing there is no getting around the idea that this was anticipated and completely expected. In fact, it was predicted and it was a necessary thing that was going to happen. Well, verse back in um, Luke chapter 18, verse 34, but the disciples understood none of these things. If you read this real quick, oh, if you read this real quick, it kind of sounds like he just says the, the same thing three times. It kind of sounds like he's just kind of repeating himself. I know what that would be like. It, it's like when you got the, the social studies assignment and, and you've written it out and, and it's actually one page and you go, oh, this is supposed to be a four pager. And so you just keep on saying the same thing over and over again. Just gonna, you know, is that what is that what Luke is doing here? No. Uh, although it sounds like there are rough synonyms, again, the world is full of words. He picks these ones. He's saying something. He's he's changing the terminology. He's saying something very specific. They understood none of these things. The meaning of the statement was hidden from them. They did not comprehend. What sort of things is he emphasizing? here. Well, first of all, they did not understand. Helpful to know what the actual Greek word is. Sunekain. Sunekain. Um, the word, the beginning part is soon. And, and we have our English uh, thing of syn, synthetic, to put together. Synthesis. The idea of, and, and, and this, this particular word means they had not been able to put the pieces together. They had not been able to synthesize the data. They weren't able to connect the dots, is really what he's saying. They, they saw the data and they weren't able to properly utilize them and, and come up with, spit out the, the, the right data out of it. So that was their first thing. They, they weren't able to synthesize all of the stuff that was there. Next thing it says, it was hidden from them, which sounds like, oh, well, I mean, poor, poor wretches. I mean, they were, they were maybe trying and they maybe were, had a good heart, but God wasn't letting them understand. And that's not, in, not what's being said here. There is a sense in which God had not yet granted them the ability to process and come up with the right conclusion. That's true. What it was is... They held to their own view and they held to their own timeline and they had not had the wisdom and they had not had the humility to allow those presuppositions to be deconstructed. They were still holding on. No, don't tell me anything about end times. I already know. And, and even if Jesus would say, but here's how it's going to happen, and here's the order, they go, no, no, I, I, I know end times, it's good. I don't, you don't have to tell them, I, I know exactly what's going to happen. Unteachableness. So it was hidden from them because, because of their presuppositions and because they had um, basically closed themselves off from having any fine-tuning of what was going on. And the next one, it says they could not comprehend and it is a cognate of the word ginosko, which is the idea of a knowledge based on experience. You would say in this connection, they had not walked through and experienced this thing yet. And, and that is true, because when you got out the other end on the, the resurrection of Christ, ah, they got it. Finally, they get it because they walk through and they go, Oh, now we're, now we're getting it. Now, now we're understanding, comprehending. Well, what are we supposed to take away from all of this? Well, here's some things that I want our hearts to be safeguarded against. There is a 
weak spin that is frequently being put out there. It was a weak spin in this age, in this time. And that was, what happened to the body of Christ? Well, everybody, by common consent, they knew God raised him from the dead. And when Peter said that, they, 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 they couldn't say anything. But there was a spin being put on by the leaders of Judaism. And they said, here's the deal. Here's what happened. The disciples had this keen insight into some of these prophecies. And so they decided of their own that they were going to steal the body of Christ out from under a, an armed guard and, and then perpetuate the idea that he's risen from the dead. And so this was all uh, some sort of a regular concoction where the disciples were, were you know, trying to keep the, the hope alive type of thing. And you go, would people believe that? Well, obviously not in that age. At that age, uh, a preacher could come up and say, God's raised him from the dead and, and you guys are all witnesses, right? And they go, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. But there's a, there would be a, a group of people who would say, yeah, no, I, I'll bet it is the disciples who stole him away. The ones who had decided, I insist on not believing. And I will grab onto any, anything that will explain it some other way than Jesus rose from the dead. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, I got problems. So I'm just going to grab onto any other excuse. Okay? And here's, we know, even from just looking at the data, if they had stolen the body of Christ, and if they, even if the, the uh, officials had really believed that, well, would they, well, they'd, if, if that had been the case, they would have broken an official seal. They would have broken something that was sealed by the Roman government. The Roman government was in every possibility to come in and put them to death for that. But the government, Romans didn't even come close to putting them under arrest, anything. They, they went nowhere near him, any of the disciples. Why? Because there was not a shred of evidence that the body was stolen. Not a shred of evidence. Um, the story was circulated according to Matthew that the reason this all happened was that the soldiers fell asleep. And everybody knew if you fall asleep on a watch, what's, what is the government going to do? What is the Roman government, what is the Roman army going to do to you? Well, they kill you. They kill you. But you look at the behavior of the officials, here they confess, yeah, no, we fell asleep and the disciples stole them, and yet they're not dead? Obviously, it's a spin. It's, it's a very weak spin. It's a fabricated, false story that they trotted out. And, and I say this because, watch. In two or three months' time, when we get close to Easter, it's going to be, again, trotted out like it is every year. And, and some of the mainstream media go, hey, we got brand new stuff here. Hey, we just have figured this out. What really happened is, you'll never believe it, the, those silly Christians, they believe it. But we now know, the officials now being sophisticated, now we know what really happened. Actually, the disciples stole the body. Okay, that'll be trotted out, watch again this year. It's trotted out every Easter. And, and, uh, and those that are absolutely adamant, yes, I want to believe Christ is false. We'll run with it. But why is this passage? Why is this verse? But the disciples understood none of these things. The meaning of the statement was hidden from them, and they did not comprehend this was not a conspiracy concocted by the disciples of Christ. They say that there's, in every event, there's a group of people who are making it happen. There are a group of people who are watching it happen. And there are a group of people who, about 10 days later, go, what happened? That's the disciples, okay? They are the ones who are making it happen. 
They weren't even all that alert when it was happening. They were that group of people who were going, what happened? They were the last to know what was happening, never mind mastermind the happening. That's why this verse is important. This was not some sort of a thing that was concocted by the disciples. Here's another one that's going to get trotted out. Just absolutely count on it. Because it's trotted out every Easter. It couldn't possibly be that the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ was not just some sort of a, a cruel, unlooked-for, unanticipated outcome that kind of took God by surprise and took Christ by surprise. And, and they'll say, it can't be possible that, that God would have done this, or as Isaiah chapter 53 says, it pleased the Father to bruise the Son. They say, that, that can't be the God that I serve. And, of course, you know, there's a chap who's, I won't mention it because I don't want you to go look at any of his stuff, but he has written that if that were the case, then it is a case of, and his term was, cosmic child abuse. If the father would do that to the son, it's a case of cosmic child abuse. Missing the very idea that in Isaiah chapter 53, actually, let's go there for a minute, Isaiah chapter 53, so we see the answer that is written right in here. Chapter 53, verse 10, But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. Well, what does that mean in the Hebrew? It means the Lord was pleased to crush him. Uh, just exactly what it says. It, the Lord was pleased to be putting him to grief. But watch the next statement. If he would, and here's the volitional, render himself as a guilt offering. It was the will of the Son to do it. In fact, that's the very point he makes over and over again in the Scriptures. The good shepherd voluntarily, deliberately lays down his life for the sheep. So it isn't a case of cosmic child abuse. He offered himself up. Many, many who will describe themselves as Christian, who are operating in the, in the realm of the Christian church, still will be describing what happened here in, uh, the, in, in the passion of the Christ that we're going to be spending quite a bit of time on as some sort of a tragic, disappointing, devastating plot twist. It was, it was a tragedy somehow. And the whole point of this the whole point of this passage is, no, it wasn't. Fully anticipated, absolutely, deliberately what the plan of God was. Absolutely, deliberately. Or, how do you do finer than the words of Peter here? Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 4 as he's praying. Acts chapter 4. Verse 20, For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. When they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them, on account of the people, because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. For the man was more than 40 years old, on whom this miracle of hearing, healing had been performed. When they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant said, Why did the nations rage and the people devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and his Christ. For truly in this city, watch this, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, whom you Christo, you anointed, 
both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. What were the causes that we could see of how Christ was crucified? Well, Pontius Pilate, Herod, Gentiles, people of Israel, they were the ones that made it happen, he's saying. But the point that Peter's going to make here is an, a very important theological point. They were only secondary causes, the primary cause, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. The whole point is, any cause that put Christ to death that was human-based was only a secondary cause. The primary cause, it pleased the Father to bruise the Son. It pleased the Father to bruise the Son. We need to be operating under the assumption that whatever was going to happen, and that's why we have this passage, whatever was going to be happening, Jesus knew it fully, and he was walking into it deliberately, insisting that it happened because that was the only way it was ever going to be at the decision that occurred within the Godhead between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It was predestined, it was foreordained, it was embraced. It was embraced. Because that's the only way you're going to get saved. If Jesus was just a victim and bad stuff happened to him, there, there, there isn't anything really good that can come out of that from a theological perspective. But what it really was is that the unblemished sacrifice willingly went and offered up himself. It was the intention of Christ to do this because if you are trusting in anything else to save you, Whatever that thing is that you're trusting is the focal point of your damnation. You need to be trusting in the fact that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ really took place. It wasn't some sort of a stage thing. And it was the full intention of the Godhead because that is how your sins are going to be paid. Understanding that and embracing that is the means by which you're going to have eternal life. Rejecting that, and at some point in time, rejecting the very point of Scripture, you do so to the eternal peril of your soul. What an important passage to understand. So if you're here today and you have, at some point in time, fallen under the teaching of some of the liberal theologians and, and, and you're not adamant on the idea that Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen and he, he dove into it anyway, um, you need to be disabused of that horrendous theology. One other point that I want to make in conclusion, and, and it's not necessarily native to me. It was the first time I heard it, and it wasn't native to him, but first time I heard it articulated uh, with great clarity was um, um, Paul Washer. Uh, he made the point at a shepherd's conference that I was at. He said, why was Christ in agony in the Garden of Gethsemane? What was that for? And, and very often uh, on a Good Friday service, there'll be a lot of attention given to the idea, well, he knew the kind of um, the, the kind of physical suffering that he was going to undergo, and and in view and in anticipation, knowing fully all the physical suffering he was going to go, he was he was terrified. And and Paul Washer makes the point, and I think it's a, a very good one. Through the church history, little teenage girls have been sentenced to death by lions, and they took it courageously. Uh, old grandfathers knew that they were going to be torn limb from limb in, in a coliseum in front of people, suffering incredible indignities, and, and, and there were no tears. What in the world was driving Christ 
to tears? Was it, was it the threat of physical violence? And the answer is no. What was the, the thing that was the, the critical thing on his life was separation. Separation. We saw several places where it says that he, any of the, the, the sources around him that would be a source of comfort were removed from him. Including... For the very first time in the history of the universe, any comfort from the Father, as the Father turned his back on the Son and poured out his wrath on the Son, as though the Son were the proper object of his torturous anger. The point is, he was. He was. Why? Because this idea of imputation is, is not just sort of legal fiction. It's real. Jesus took our legal standing. And when Jesus took our legal standing, it was, in fact, the only thing that a God of justice could do if he genuinely possessed our legal standing, the only thing a righteous God could do would be to pour out wrath. That and the separation for the first time in all of eternity that had come between the Son and the Father is what was causing the anguish of Gethsemane. It wasn't just the physical. So when we're thinking of the sorrows, that's what I wanted to conclude with, when we're thinking of the sorrows of Christ, the real issue is not what Herod did, not what Pilate did, or the Jews or the Romans. It's what I did. It's what you did. And him taking my legal standing, I'll be responsible for that and then taking it while he could slip out from under it, willingly taking it where God poured out the wrath on him that should have come to me. That's the biggest sorrow and suffering of our Lord. So, if you're wondering who to blame, if you're wondering what the greatest source of the sorrow of Christ is, it's me. And that's you. But God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were sinners, he died for us. Oh, what manner of love the Father has given unto us. that we would be called the sons of God. That you would, in a real way, take on my legal standing, and in a very real way, give me yours. Oh, what a salvation this, that Christ liveth in me. Heavenly Father, as we walk out of here, and as we as we consider the passion of our Christ, as we consider this one who, knowing everything that was coming, adamantly, with a spring in his step, marched up the hill toward Jerusalem to pay my sin. I would pray, Lord, you'd help us to be a group of people who are thankful, a group of people who are worshipful, a group of people who just can't help but go about and tell the people around us the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us to be those people for your glory and for our joy, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.